It actually all started out when I was four years old on the side of my house, this house that we're in. And I had a lot of yard to play in since I lived on a double lot. And since I had a lot of yard, kill the man with the ball was the best sport to play with my neighbors. There was this kid, Charlie Swartz, who was five years older than us. And then when I realized that I juked him out a few times to score, I got that adrenaline rush of like scoring a touchdown almost at four years old. So my neighbor, Doug, who used to play, was playing with us, his mom was signing him up for the Port Reading Saints. And my mom was like, do you want to play? And I said, absolutely, if it feels anything like that. So it all started with killing me in with the ball on the side of the house. So they put me on the offensive line and, you know, I was doing what I needed to do. And then they saw me run one time. And they're like, wait, this big kid can run. And they put me at this quarterback as my flag football team. And I was the biggest one out there. During football season, my mom would always work until 5, 530. Yeah, I practiced at 6. And some days, you know, I didn't want to go to practice. I just wanted to, you know, I'll show up for the game. I'll be all right. Not my mom. My mom made me go to every practice, dragging me out of the park, throwing me in the backseat of her car, saying, you committed to this sport or to this team, you're going to every practice. And she taught me that at a young age. Commitment. There was this pair of, of shoes I wanted. I really wanted these Hyperflight shoes. Uh, these red sneakers, patent leather, shiny. I need these. And she said, if you get good grades, then I'll get you these shoes. And I was like, hey, I gotta get good grades for these. I thought she would just get them. And first she told me I need to get an A on my test. And I ended up getting an A. She goes, wait, that was a little bit too easy. And you make the honor roll, then you'll get the, then you get the sneakers. And then she stuck to her word and she went and got me those sneakers after I got the honor roll. And I remember walking around cheesing with them. Ruckers was with me since I was a freshman in high school. I was getting recruited during the 05, 06, 07 seasons. That's when Ray Rice and all of them were absolutely killing it up there. And I'm like, you know, I want to be a part of this. You know, why should I take my talent somewhere else? When New Jersey, I could be one of the first to win a Big East championship at the time was the goal, or make it to the national championship, things like that. And the things that Coach Shiano was doing with the program, honestly, that was like the best part about it. And I'd be only 15, 20 minutes down the road, I can get tickets for my, my family, my friends, everybody can just come and see me. And like, it was the, it was the new upcoming, upcoming school to be at. Everyone was talking about it, it was on a national stage. And so, it was just a no brainer for me. I just can't get away from Eric Legrand, who drags him down at the 20 yard line. Then a sack for Legrand. i never forget the day he actually called me up first and asked me how I was feeling. I was like, Coach, I actually think I want to commit to you. And he said to me when I said, I think I want to commit to you, he goes, men give their word. They don't think, they know for sure. So when you know for sure, you call me back and you let me know. And if you want to do it now, we can do it now. And I was like, Coach, I'll call you back in two minutes. <laughs> and I called my mom up and I told her, Mom, I think I want to do this and all. And she was all aesthetic. She goes, if you really want to do it, I had, you know, she she wanted me to go there since it was right here. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. Called him back up two minutes later. I said, Coach, you have my word. I'm committing to you. I'm coming to Rutgers. And he said, congratulations. Got everybody on the phone and everything. And it was just just like, whew. He molded boys into men. That's what he did. Turning 18-year-old children coming in there into grown men, leaving at 21, 22 years old. And, you know, we used to go through tough times of practice in the middle of the summer and running 22 gassers after that. And you're sitting there like, what am I doing with my life right now? It's 115 degrees on this turf, but he keeps on pushing and pushing and pushing, grinding you and getting the best out of you and making you realize and really see how far can I push myself and, you know, and he always, he goes using different references. What if you ever lose your job? Are you ever going to leave your family and give up on them? Things like that, trying to motivate you. So I stay poised. I stay calm in the situation and handle whatever it is. I don't freak out and lose, lose my cool. Trained behavior becomes instinct. That's what he always used to say. And if something ever goes down, I, whoever it is, I sit there, I figure out what it is and what I need to do. I thank him for that and all the coaches that put us through, through the craziness at Rutgers, we called it. 
here at the Meadowlands, the new Giant Stadium. We're out here ready to go, being focused. We're gonna keep on chopping all day long. Imagine you're in a rainforest, stuck in a rainforest, and the only thing that, that you, you can get out is to chop down one tree at a time. You chop, chop, chop until that tree falls down. You take a deep breath, you celebrate it for that moment, and then it's on to the next one. And that's what he used it for life, you know, when it, when it became with the season. You chop that week long through that week to ever get past wherever your opponent was. You chop that tree down, you go through your reevaluation re period. If you won, you lost. You enjoy that moment, and then it's on to the next one. This will be Brown from his three. Crosses at 10, 15, 20. Oh. And he gets drilled right at the 25 Ooh. yard line. Wait, he's hurt. Big hit by Eric Legrand, who is shaken up. The first thing is coming to acceptance of it is what it is now. You know, you can't go back and change. You can think, what if I never would have, you know, ran down the field? What if I would have got blocked in the double team and let somebody else make the tackle? When he went down and I watched him fall, I knew instantly something was wrong. And then when the coach called me to come down on the field, and he, he came over to me and he said, you just have to pray. After he was injured, those days, even weeks, months, it seems like, it seems like a blur now because I'd walk around in a, in a daze, you know, not really knowing what was going to happen day to day. Eric went through some, you know, some tough times when he was first injured. It was a very, very serious injury. He was on a ventilator. He couldn't breathe. He couldn't move. He couldn't really talk in the beginning, so it was it was terrifying. I just came down off of a 105.5 degree fever, and my mom and sister were sleeping there next to each other. My coach, Coach Anna was in there too, sleeping. And I remember hearing this girl get rushed into the ICU, and she had a cancerous tumor growing on her growing on her brain, and it started to bleed. So they had to come do, of course, surgery right away. And I see all these kids walking. Well, first our family members, of course, mom, dad, like uncles and cousins. About an hour later, I see those same faces walk out hysterically crying and come to find out that girl didn't make it through the night. And it made me say to myself, whatever I need to do, God, if I need to pray, if I need to get up and get, get to rehab, if I need to relax more, I'm gonna do because I do not want my family, my friends, my teammates have to leave the hospital in tears like after seeing that happen. And I was just like, you know what? Whatever I need to do, I'm doing it from here on out. He was in surgery for nine hours. And when he came out of surgery, he said to me, just barely, I, I, he kind of mouthed the words because he couldn't talk. He had a breathing tube going down his throat. I'll be back. When he said that, I knew my son is going to fight. You know, everything that's happened in my life you know, over the past five and a half years now has honestly been a true blessing. You think of all the people I've gotten to meet, the places I've gotten to go, the opportunities, you know, using my platform, being able to start up a foundation, Tima Grant, the Chris Friend Dana Reed Foundation, to help other people, you know, it's just, it's, it's been an honor, you know, I've been able to still finish getting my degree, you know, I don't get down on things, I got my great mom taking care of me, I got great nurses, I got great friends, I look at all that stuff now, that's how I reevaluate, like, wow, I think about where I would be without it, you know, I think this could have been my fourth year in the NFL, what team would I been been playing on, this and that, which state would I have been living in, what family, I think about that every day, and I'm not going to lie to you, but then I also think about the stuff that I do have now, and the people that are in similar situations as I am right now that are nowhere near as fortunate as I am. And that's what kind of keeps me level-headed and grounded. Like, all right, you may have it, you know, like this, but it's nowhere near as bad as this person has or this or that person, you know. So be thankful for what you do have. Yeah, you know, this injury happened to me. So it's just like, you know, my goal is to walk again. I think about you know, what, where would I be if I got up tomorrow? I dream about that every night. I try to get a message across to all kids that you never know what somebody's dealing with at home. I always try to say it could be a lot worse. Look at your friends that you do have. Look at the opportunities that you do have. It may be rough for you now, but there's always light at the end of the tunnel that you can get to if you put your mind to it. We all have our different pathways. Some have more adversities than other people. Some may have a smooth sailing through life, and that's it. Not usually that doesn't happen. There's always a bunch of speed bumps, but some may have more speed bumps and more hiccups than other people. You just have that makes you tougher and makes you the person that you are. And as you get older, you're going to realize, wow, you know, this is what molded me into the person I am today. This is your life and how do you want to be remembered? What type of legacy do you want to leave in this world? Just because something bad happens to you doesn't mean that you can't do other things or you may not, may not be as easy anymore. It may be harder. 
to make friends and do, do this, but it ultimately comes back to loving yourself and setting a goal for what you want to do and reaching that goal and working hard to attain that goal. We're a tough crowd. We definitely are, you know, we're different. You know, we, I believe we can handle all situations. You throw someone in Jersey in the middle of some survival situation, we're going to come out on top. But at the end of the day, you put Jersey up versus somebody, I'm taking a Jersey guy because, you know, we always have each other's back no matter what. It's going to be my fifth season coming up with Rutgers Radio. You know, God willing to be working with Chris Collin again. Chris Collin's been my mentor since day one. I also have a show now on Sirius XM, breaking down all the college football on Sundays and Mondays. You know, do appearances with the Big Ten Network, talking about Rutgers all the time, and work with ESPN doing a, on their college podcast. Love to break down the game of football and be around the game, and you know, that's what keeps me going. I want to be remembered as someone who never gave up, worked his butt off for what he wanted and what he believed in, but also knew how to have a good time with his friends and his family and do the, and enjoy life. I realized when my situation, when so many people are giving back to me, you know, wanting to, how can I help you here? How can I do this for you? How can I do that? It became a point where it was like, all right, now it's my time to give back and help other people. And I formed my foundation, Team LeGrand of the Chris Brandon and Reed Foundation. And we're a fundraising branch off of them because we believe in their initiatives, you know. We want to find a cure for paralysis, but our main goal is to have better people's quality of life that are dealing with paralysis. So I try to raise as much awareness and as much funds as I can to find a cure for this one day. And I truly believe that we will find a cure for paralysis, and I'm glad to be a part of it.